All right, Jai Radha Madhava. Everybody know this song? It's one, of, it's one of Prabhupada's favorite. Okay. Let's see how many we, we have to have 10 people or else there's no class. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. 14, 15, 16, 16. <laughs> Okay, since we have five too much, five of you can leave. <laughs> okay. All right, here he comes, the man who is the man of the man. He's going to make sure all the airwaves get connected. Okay, the broadcast man. Okay. Okay, ready? Everybody know the song? I can't get no satisfaction, and I try, and I try. That, okay, that's my favorite song, right? <laughs> At least that's the number one song right now on the top of my charts. <laughs> okay, are you ready? If, and if you're not, you should be. <laughs> okay, ready? Get set, go. Hey! Okay, that's the warm up band. Okay. <laughs> get to the main show. <laughs> okay. You ready? I'm not. <laughs> What's the name of that song we're going to sing? What is it? I forgot. What is it? Okay, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. We have somebody in the audience that knows the song. Okay. You ready? Okay. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're going to start soon. Because if we don't, the clock keeps moving, and we're not grooving. So we better get moving. Okay, you ready? Okay, go. <laughs> He's praying for me. Somebody better pray for me. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jabi ha hari jai Jai Gopi Janavallabha Kiri Vara Hari Gopi Janavallabha Jai Gopi Janavallabha Giri Vara Dhammahi Jai Giri Sodanandana Raja Janahanja
someday <laughs> okay you can hold him pick him up yeah if you want to babies like be held up by ladies okay so I what number of verse is it 
10, two. two. I can see there's a lot of progress being made. I did 10-1 about a week ago. <laughs> well, this is Bhagavad Gita as I see it. <laughs> Not Bhagavad Gita as it is. Okay, so this is a lengthy purport. 17-page purport. Okay, ready for it. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Name Vidu Suragana Prabhavam Namaharshayaha Aham Marirhi Devanam Maharshinam Cha Sarvasaha Name Vidu Surgana Prabhavam Namaharshayaha Ahamarir hi devanam Maharsinam chasarvasya ha Back here. Ooh, you're trying to take my position and steal the show. Huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to report you to the higher authorities. <laughs> we'll give you, t t arrest you by the temple police. <laughs> okay. Ready? Nah. Nah. Never. Never. May. My, my. Vidu. Vidu. No. no. Suragana. The, the demigods. Prabhavam. Origin. Origin. Opulences. Opulences. Na. Na. Never. Mahash. Maharishaha. Great sages. Great sages. Aham. Aham. I am. I am. Adi. Adi. The origin. origin. He. Certainly, Devanam, the demigods, Maharishinam, of the great sages, Cha, also, Sarvasaha, in all respects. So Krishna in this chapter is going to really show where, what is his actual position in relationship to everything. So this chapter really illustrates Krishna's supreme position in all categories of life. And this is a very interesting chapter. Neither the host of demigods nor the great sages know my origin or opulences. For in every respect, I am the source of the demigods, 
and the sages. Please repeat. Neither the host of the demigods, nor the great sages, know my origin or opulences. For in every respect, I am the source of the demigods and sages. So Krishna is showing his position in relationship to the devas, and no one knows him. As stated in the Brahma Samhita, who knows that verse? Thank you. Yeah. Ishwar Parma Krishna Satchit Ananda. Satchit Ananda Na'a. Ishwar Parma Krishna Satchit Ananda Vigraha. Anadir Adir Govinda Sarva Karna Karna. So Prabhupada is going to explain that verse in little word for word here. No one is greater than him. He is the cause of all causes. He is also stated by the Lord person that he is the cause of the demigods and the sages. Even the demigods and great sages cannot understand Krishna. They can understand neither his name nor his personality. So what is the position of the so-called scholars of this tiny planet? No one can understand why the Supreme God comes to earth as an ordinary human being and executes such wonderful, uncommon activities. One should know then that scholarship is not the qualification necessary to understand Krishna. Even the demigods and great sages have tried to understand Krishna by their mental speculation, and they have failed to do so. In the Srimad Bhagavatam also it is clearly said that even the great demigods are not able to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They can speculate to the limits of their imperfect senses and they can reach opposite conclusions of impersonalism of something that manif not manifested by the three modes of material nature. Or they can imagine something by mental speculation but it's not possible to understand Krishna by such foolish speculation. Hmm. So now Prabhupada explains how people try in their wrong ways to understand Krishna, uh, speculation or by negation, by saying he is not something part of this material manifestation. But you cannot establish a positive simply by speaking about what it's not. This is an interesting point. People say there is no God. But you cannot prove that God does not exist. Because you can only prove something that is positive. You can't prove a negative. So there's a science called epistemology, which means the science of knowledge. How to understand something. And epistemology says you cannot use proof on a negative. In other words, there's no logic for proving that God does not exist. Because when something doesn't exist, how do you use logic to prove it? See, this is a very important point for devotees to know because we run up to people who say God does not exist. And people give, and there's scientists and other people who or atheists and give these reasons. For instance, um, can you prove a 20-headed lion does not exist? Well, you might say, well, nobody has seen one. Okay, but that's not enough proof. Then what proof can you prove that it doesn't exist? You can't. So, in other words, a negative has no logical discussion. You can only prove something that is existing because the logic that that applies doesn't work with a negative because you there's so many things that don't exist so how can you prove something that doesn't exist you know, there's no proof there's no way of proving so therefore when they say well god does not exist and they give the reasons why the reasons are always wrong because you can't prove a negative. 
But you can prove God exists, that you can prove, but you can't prove he doesn't exist. Now this is an interesting thing because the, you'll find there are so-called physicists, scientists, and other forms, persons who come up with reasons why God doesn't exist, but the reasons don't, have no, don't, don't really under, contain all the possibilities of non-existence because you can't, there's no way you can do that. Non-existence is unlimited. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a lot of things that don't exist. <laughs> so how do you prove it? <laughs> so therefore, when you run up against a person who says God does not exist and I can prove it, you should know he's a fool. <laughs> not be only because he said God does not exist, but because his logic he uses to prove it is also all wrong. The whole idea, the whole premise is wrong. That's, uh, that's what Prabhupada's saying here. Here, the Lord directly, indirectly says that if anyone wants to know the absolute truth, here I am present as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I am the Supreme, one should know this. Although one cannot understand the inconceivable Lord who is personally present, he nonetheless exists. We can understand Krishna who is eternal, full of bliss and knowledge, simply by studying his words in the Bhagavad Gita and in Srimad Bhagavatam. The conception of God as some ruling power or as an impersonal Brahman cannot be reached by persons who are in the inferior energy of the Lord. But the personality of Godhead cannot be conceived unless one is in the transcendental position. So just to know him, you have to be above the three modes of material nature. Because most men cannot understand Krishna in his actual situation, out of his causeless mercy, he descends to show favor to such speculators. Yet despite the Supreme Lord's uncommon activities, these speculators, due to contamination in the material energy, still think that the impersonal Brahman is the Supreme. Only the devotees who are fully surrendered unto the Supreme Lord can understand by the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead that He is Krishna. Only by His grace can we understand He is Krishna. The devotees of the Lord do not bother about the impersonal Brahman conception of God. Their faith and devotion bring them to surrender, to surrender immediately unto the Supreme Lord and out of the causeless mercy of Krishna they can understand Krishna. No one else can understand him, so even great sages agree. What is Atma? What is the Supreme? It is he whom we have to worship. Okay. This sounds like so Omagyan Timiranda Syangina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guravena Maha. Shri Chaitanya Manobi Stam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Ti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nir Vishesha Sunyavari Pasyati Re Satarine <coughs> Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari, Gaur, Bhakta Vrindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai, Pancha Kaupa, Darubascha, Kripa Sindhu, Bebacha, Patitanam, Bhavane Bhyo, Vaishnave Bhyo, Namaha, Namaha. Hmm. So, how do we know that God exists? Somebody told you? He says. Hmm? He, says. he says it. Yeah, but when did you talk to him last? <laughs> so, so he says it. And so he says it. Where does he say it, though? In Vedic. Hmm? In Vedic scriptures. In scriptures. Okay. And so um, 
but scriptures are written down by by uh, people of this world. So should we believe it or not? They're they're liberated. So that their quality. What is their quality? But how how can you how can how can you believe that they know the truth? Because they have seen the truth. So how do, if someone says, "Well, I you know I saw this person," and, I, and so how do you how 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 do you take a person's word when they speak? What is that that allows you to accept something from someone and something something someone something from not some some someone else? In other words, who do you believe and who do you don't believe? <laughs> Hmm? <laughs> well, you might have faith in the wrong thing. <laughs> faith and trust. In what? Well, how do you establish this? You can meet a person just for the first time. Do you have faith and trust in it? Okay, it takes time to develop faith and trust. You can't immediately accept anything people say. You have to have some faith and trust based on what? If a person has good, uh, uh, how you say, um, good qualities, you accept them because uh, we know it's the guru. So you have to get to know the person, right? Yeah, but you can see such qualities he is uh, reflected. Well, that means... How long does that take? Does it, you know, make take time to find out his qualities? Okay. So um, we uh, we trust that these great personalities who who have seen the truth and are writing the truth in the scriptures are not uh, ordinary people. They're not just people you, you meet every day. They're self-realized souls. And so you observe how they live, and you also understand what they're saying. And then when you practice what they say, and you get the benefit of what they say, then you can start to develop your trust in them. Hmm. So this, this Bhagavad Gita is spoken by the Supreme Lord, but it's explained by a pure devotee who has seen Krishna and knows Krishna by his power of devotion. But then there are people who take Bhagavad Gita and write their own commentaries and give you a different understanding of Krishna and say that Krishna is just a, a very powerful person, maybe he's an incarnation of God. He is uh, actually, Bhagavad Gita is a nice story, but it never really happened. You get a lot of people who take Bhagavad Gita and write Bhagavad Gita and then they give their commentaries. So, just like we read from the first verse, how this one person was, Prabhupada mentions it in the purport, how he was saying that it's not to Krishna you have to surrender, it's the un, unborn, unmanifested aspect within Krishna. So people have faith in that person because he, he, he did Bhagavad Gita and he's also a spiritualist. But he's wrong. <laughs> he's wrong. So there, and people are being fooled by such persons. So it's not easy to understand who is a real, genuine spiritual person and who, in the name of spirituality, may be a phony or not genuine or may present themselves as knowing more than they actually do and giving the wrong understanding. So it takes time and it takes faith and trust don't develop overnight. It's not something you can just say, well, I trust you. 
you can, yeah, sometimes you trust people and then after a while you find that there's something else. They, they break your trust or they do something against your trust. Oh, well, it takes time. So Prabhupada came and it was many times we had to ask many questions. And Prabhupada would speak. And some people understood Prabhupada immediately because they could, have, they could feel the potency of his words. But others, although Prabhupada was speaking, they questioned what he said. And only when they were convinced did they agree and then eventually did they become disciples. So it wasn't like always so easy that simply by a qualified person comes into one's presence he becomes immediately accepted. And Prabhupada writes that in the uh, fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, that blind fe following and absurd inquiries are rejected. So one should know. And Prabhupada did the same thing to us. He said, how do you know Krishna is God? He said it to a whole group of, of his disciples. And someone said, they said, well, Prabhupada, you said it. Prabhupada said, no, <laughs> that's not enough. <laughs> How do you know Krishna is God? Oh, yeah. Anybody can write that down. <laughs> yeah, but... They might. What they. What. What are they realizing? Mm -hmm. Well, they. They. They observed his physiognomy. Physiognomy means his bodily features, and there are thirty-two. Thirty-two bodily features of a great soul. If you know the science of physiognomy, you can see a person and you can tell the quality of that person just looking at them by their bodily features. If you know the 32 characteristics, uh, the physical characteristics of it, that's how they understood Sukadeva Goswami. They saw him immediately. He had all 32 qualities. But... Um, you chant Krishna's name, and what happens? You give up all bad habits, and you develop good qualities, and you start serving the Supreme. So that's an indication that Krishna is the Supreme. Because simply by chanting his name, or worshipping him, you're being transformed. <laughs> that's another way. I can't remember what Prabhupada said in the final conclusion, but he was just testing his devotees because he wanted to let them, give them a chance to understand that, you know, you should not simply, you should know factually that Krishna is God and should be able to explain it if, it, if the need comes, if someone questions you, you have to be able to explain. He, how he is the supreme personality of Godhead. <clears throat> yeah. Also, this bring uh, only tested trinity of deities with the high. What are the three? Uh, Shiva, Brahma, and Vishnu. Mm. Is it offended with uh, Mandalay? Uh, oh, or Brigham Muni, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the story from the Shastras. But sometimes people don't even believe Shastra. They think Shastra is, sometimes they think it's just some nice stories written by some great personalities in order to attract people to devotional life. Mm -hmm. What do you say when people say that? Well, these, uh, these things you're reading, they're so fantastic. They're, not, they're just nice stories. They make interesting read. They talk about spiritual things. But... They're not true. They're just nice stories. What do you say? It's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> you leave it up to them. You must try. Hmm? You must try and set 
I said, oh, okay, well, they're, they're reading the stories, and they're hearing the stories, but they don't believe. They believe it's just story. Yeah, this is um, Yeah, the thing is, here, in this verse, I mean, I'm sorry, in this chapter, Krishna, uh, Arjuna helps Krishna to establish who, who he is. He says, here, Arjuna says, you are the supreme personality of Godhead, the ultimate abode, the purest, the absolute truth. You are the eternal, transcendental, original person, the unborn, the greatest. And here is the conclusion. All the great sages such as Narada, Asita, Devala, Vyasa, Confirm this truth about you, and now you yourself are declaring it to me. So this is it, that these personalities who are great sages, who have realized by their own devotion the nature of the absolute truth, they are confirming, not just one, Vyas, Narada, Sita, Deva, and then you can go down and include many more, are all saying the same thing. So when it gets confirmed by these persons, then that has authority. <laughs> that has authority. So how do you know, and it says Lord Brahma, in every universe, he has, in this universe, he has four heads, because this is the smallest universe. But if you go to other universes, he has more heads. And the bigger the universe, this is the universe we're in is probably one of the smallest of all universes. And that's how, and this universe is how, about, how many billions of miles? I think four billion miles in, in, a, in all directions. Yeah. So this is a small one. <laughs> And so each of the universes have a Brahma with as many heads as the size of the universe. So, okay, Sabine, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. So now in some universes they have, Brahma has 10 heads, 20 heads, 50 heads, 100 heads, 1,000 heads, 10,000 heads. And he also has one universe, he has 10 million heads. So can you believe that one person has 10 million heads? What would be the logic <clears throat> that you would use if you had to use logic? You could say, well, this is what the scriptures say. But give me a, a logical explanation how that is possible. I'll, I'll open it up to everybody. What would be a logical explanation that you could somehow say, to prove that this is possible. <laughs> yes. Well, you. Well, they can't prove it. No, we can't. How can we prove it? That, that is this true? We believe. Hmm? We believe. Well, so many people believe so many things. <laughs> you can believe that that China is is right next to Slovenia if you want. <laughs> so belief is not. I can give you a logical explanation of how you can begin to understand this principle. Yes, you want Prabhu. Okay, here's the logic. Have you ever seen or heard of a pe person in this world who is different than the, who is a human being but is different than other human beings? For instance, are there human beings that have two heads in this world? Yeah. 
they have shows, at least they have them in America, they call them freak shows, that's what they call them, where they have an unusual, maybe a dog with two heads or a human being with two heads, or a person with three or four arms, yeah. So if there is something beyond the norm and you can see it, then you take that same principle and you project it. That if this is possible, then that is also possible. If something is beyond the norm and you can experience that abnormality or a supposed abnormality, that means that logically speaking, that same principle can be extended farther and farther. Did you get the point? Yeah. I mean, I saw with this one devotee, I know he has six toes on one foot. <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> he was born in Vrindavan. <laughs> he has six toes on one of his foot. The other one foot has five toes, and the other toe foot has six toes. I've seen it. I counted it. One, two, <laughs> four, five, six. <laughs> he doesn't hide it. <laughs> and so he has 11 toes. So, and of course, there are many other unusual personalities who have different forms. They're human beings, but they would have been born with a lot of either extra arms, legs, heads, or something. So you can see it. It exists on this planet. Yeah. And so if you take that same principle, then you can say that logically speaking, if this is possible, then you can take that same principle and extend it all the way up because it's a, it shows that something like that could possibly exist, but does exist, but at least using logic, you can prove the basic principle. It's a, yeah, interesting. Hare Krishna. Yeah, like a nudge. <laughs> um, okay, so, how do we know that God exists in our daily day? How can, we, how can you see God everywhere? How can you see God everywhere at every moment? The sun is the eye. Oh, the, oh yeah, the universal form, like that. Mm -hmm. But that's an imaginary form. Well, they have to, ex they, yeah, that's for them. I'm saying how do devotees see God at every moment? Or what means do we use to see God every moment? Yes. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the uh, that was the Russians when the Russians came to colonize India. They were atheists and they were teaching that. But when they saw how the traffic in India was going, they said there must be a god. <laughs> Otherwise, nobody could drive like this and still not have an accident. But uh, what was my the idea is that. When you see anything, you connect it with the source. In other words, everything has a source, and when you take it back to the source, you come to Krishna. That's how devotees see it. So this chair I'm sitting on is made of wood, but wood comes from tree, and tree comes from the seed. And the, uh, the basic elements that make up the material energy are created by Krishna. Bhumir apa nalobhayu kamana buddha evacha ahankar iti ame bina prakriti astada. So these eight elements are created by the Lord, but they formulate themselves in different proportions and make up the material forms in this world. 
So therefore, if you connect everything with the source, then you can connect that, then you can see Krishna in every, everything. And Prabhupada used an example. He said uh, he had a pair of eyeglasses. So he took his eyeglasses and he held it up. And he said to the devotees, when you see my, when you see these eyeglasses, what do you think? Yeah, so they, yeah, they said, when we see that, we, we say that they're Prabhupada's eyeglass. Prabhupada said, yes. So anything you see belongs to Krishna. <laughs> so that way you can see Krishna within everything and everything within Krishna because nothing is outside of him. We see the forms, but behind the forms there's a source, and the, and the source is ultimately Krishna through his different energy. So we're seeing Krishna through the energy, or we're experiencing Krishna through his energy. But then again, wherever there's energy, there's a source of energy. So even if you accept the idea of the principle of energy, you have to accept the idea that there's someone who created the energy or is making the energy work. So then that way you can connect everything back to Krishna. And that's why a devotee, he can see Krishna and everything and everything in Krishna. And when he sees another devotee, he also sees that in the heart of that devotee, Krishna is there. He is the indwelling super soul. So he sees Krishna within the heart of all living entities, Vidya, Vinaya, Sampane. Brahmani, Gavi, Astani, Pandita, Samadarshan. Samadarshan means equal vision. One who sees equally sees Krishna in the heart of all living entities because he's there as the indwelling super soul. That way, any living entity, he comes in contact, he's also coming in contact with Krishna because Krishna is in the heart of that. And that's the principle of respect for other living entities. Giving respects to others means giving respects also to Krishna in the heart of that living entity. If you disrespect or offend some uh, that person, you're also creating some uh, some offense to Krishna himself because he sits in the heart of that living entity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is. This whole chapter is establishing Krishna as the Supreme. And as you go to the second part of the chapter, Krishna says, you know, I am of the mountains, I'm Himalayas, of this, I'm that, and I'm, I'm weapons, I'm the thunderbolt. As warriors, I'm Skanda. You know, he just mentions himself in relationship to the best of everything within the material energy. So this whole chapter really, that's why it's called the opulence of the absolute. All of Krishna's opulence and his supreme position in relationship to everything and everyone is being established. So this 10th chapter is really, if you have an, a working understanding of this chapter, then you can explain Krishna as the supreme personality of Godhead. Like that. It's an interesting chapter. All right, any questions? Comments? Yes. Sarvabhoma. Bhattacharya. Hare Krishna, man. Thank you very much for a nice class. So, um, small comment when you said how Prabhupada was testing devotees, right? How to show, um, to explain how does God exist and things like this. And then you mentioned that uh, how do you, uh, what's the argument for somebody who doesn't accept scriptures? Right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, came to my mind the story of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how he was dealing with Buddhists, and because the Buddhists don't accept the Vedas, basically atheists, mm -hmm. so he would defeat Buddhists with their own philosophy. Right. And then Prabhupada would give a commentary that uh, I take your mortar, mortar is a thing for crushing the spices, it's mm -hmm. like a, a stick, uh, either. Uh, stone or ceramic or metal mm -hmm. and I crash your teeth with your mortar. So it means I learn your philosophy, what you accept to be true mm -hmm. and then 
I defeat you with your own philosophy. Well, that's, that's the principle of, of argument. Argument means to take apart another person's philosophy. If you ever get into a discussion with people, don't try to convince them by saying what is. Listen, ask them what they believe in, and then just tear apart their arguments. Mm -hmm. And then there's nothing left of their argument. If you know how to, you know, tear apart their arguments, then you, um, you know, and once your, their arguments are, are destroyed by your logic and reasoning, then you present your points. But if you present something, they present something, you go back and forth and nobody wins. It's just going on back and forth. So you have to show by logic and reason that their arguments are all wrong. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you know, there's a tactic like that. I remember one time I went to a jail preaching program. And there was a real one, this was in, this was in Karlovac, in Croatia. And so there was one person in jail, he was well known all over Croatia. He was somewhat of an unusual person. He did all kinds of crazy things. And he was famous for being crazy. <laughs> so he, uh, he decided to use his intelligence to try to destroy me when I came. So he was showing off in front of all of the other inmates to see how to show how smart he was. So uh, he... Uh, He was using that same logic on me. He would say something about me, and then he would ask me, you know, well, let me see how he did it. But anyway, basically, he was, he was attacking what I was, he wanted to hear what I said so he could take it apart and destroy it and show that what I was saying was all wrong. And then I, I picked up on what he was saying, and I said, I don't have to answer your questions. <laughs> and then he was stuck. He didn't know what to do. So he tried to push it even farther, and then finally I just said, you know, sit down, you know. <laughs> so because he was just trying to make me look bad and make himself look good in front of everybody. That was his program. He didn't come to learn anything. <laughs> And the other inmates, they always saw him as some kind of hero because, you know, one time in the winter time, he, with no shoes on, with no, just plain bare feet, he walked in the snow for a long time. He was supposed to be famous for walking in snow during the winter time with no shoes on. So he was, I mean, you probably know him. I don't, I can't remember his name, but he was a crazy guy. But he was using that same thing. He knew the technique that you don't really speak so much about what you believe, but you destroy the other person. So that's how we, how we, how we did deal with people. We wait to let them explain what they have, and then you look for something that they say, and you take it apart <laughs> like that. So if you learn that, then you'll never be because when you talk to people a lot of times, you say something, they say something, you say something, and they say something. It goes back and forth, and nobody ever gets anywhere. <laughs> it just turns into an argument. Everybody wants to say what they believe, but the intelligent way is just listen to what they say, and then and just say, well, based on what you say, we say, uh, and then you use certain logic and argument like that. It's a tactic for defeating people. <laughs> it works. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have beautiful Panchatattva here. Panchatattva become Krishna. 
Bhakti Rupa, Swarupa Kam, Bhakti Avataram, Bhakti Akyam, Namami Bhakti, Bhakti Shakti Kam, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita, Gadadara, Siva, Sri Gaur, Bhakti Vrindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, if there's no more questions or comments, yes? Mm -hmm. I remember some uh, explanation that uh, people sometimes uh, want to understand transcendental activities of Krishna from 10th canto, but they, can, uh, they cannot understand material creation of universe from 5th canto. And then they are... Yeah. That's why these things are put first, because the 10th canto is the postgraduate understanding of the personality of Godhead. So Bhagavatam is describing the different levels as you go higher and higher. When you get through nine cantos, then you understand that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead who is the source of everything. He's the cause of all causes. And he incarnates in different manifestations of himself, the Vaikuntha. Now you're ready, you're at least prepared to you know, open up the door to Vrindavan. Otherwise, if you jump to the 10th canto, you'll just think, oh, these are just nice stories. That's all. That's why your first and second canto are called Swarga and Visharga, creation and subcreation. Okay. So, yeah, that's. Nobody really wants to go through the process, everybody wants to shortcut the process. Jai Sri Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Okay. That's why we, it mentions we should systematically going from the first canto and study Srimad Bhagavatam and not jump ahead. Then you get a clear understanding. Because it's sequential. It's, it's sequential, but at the same time it's not sequential. But the knowledge is given in such a way it helps you to develop your faith that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is Krishna. <laughs> And he has many manifestations of himself, and he is the source of everything. So if you study this very scientifically, or systematically, then you see that when you come to the 10th canto, it's easy, and it's easier, not easy, but it's easier to accept Krishna as a cowherd boy. <laughs> From who? From the internet. Mr. Internet, okay. <laughs> Back the internet. Okay. Back the <laughs> Please accept my humble obeisances. I like to argue sometimes, but when people are defeated, they don't want to speak anymore with me. And I am disappointed. They don't want to accept Krishna. Don't waste your time. A per, we preach to people who are a little bit submissive. When you argue with somebody, the only benefit is that if there's other people around who will hear the results of the argument, and they will benefit. The person who you usually argue with never changes. And that's a feature of Kali Yuga. Because people wear their philosophy as they wear their clothes. In other words, their philosophy is part of their ego. Wherein, in, in cultural times, if you would meet a person and you would discuss, and you were 
able to show that you, what you're saying was correct, that person would have to believe you. That would be a gentleman. But because there's no gentleman out there, <laughs> they just argue for the sake of argue. Like I remember I went to one uh, Rathiyatra, and then at the end of the Rathiyatra we had a Rathiyatra festival. So, some boy came up to me and he, he, he wanted, he, he said, well, this is the way I believe. I said, well, it's very nice what you believe, but we have our authority coming from scriptures and from great saints. He didn't want to hear that. <laughs> he wanted me to hear what he believed. <laughs> so, and that was it. He didn't come to learn, he come to just tell people what he believes. You know. So you don't waste time with them, but those people. You go, to, you go to where people who are a little bit more interested in learning, and you speak to them. The only reason we argue is that if there's other people around, they can benefit from the argument. But the person you usually argue with this is, the, this is the characteristic of this age. Nobody accepts defeat. Even if you defeat them, they don't accept it. But that's not intelligent. Arguments have to base, be based on Shastra and based on, on logic and reason. All three have to be there. You can logically, with reason, explain how the Shastras are factual. You can't just say the Shastras are factual. You have to use logic and reason to explain how they are factual. Mm -hmm. By presenting the knowledge in a different way that is easily understandable. But otherwise, just don't waste your time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gaur Pemanandi.